Surely our praises belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator, the sustainer, and the controller of all that happens in the universe. And we invoke his peace and blessings upon his noble messenger, his family, his companions, and all those who follow them in righteousness until the end of time. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. There is one more issue about Hajj that I would like to share with you. I know Hajj is over, but I think for those who haven't been for Hajj, uh, this is the time to think, to start thinking about it and to plan for it. Uh, it's not something you can decide uh, at the last moment. It, it needs some planning uh, and it needs time. So in as much as it might just be over, it might make sense for those who are thinking of going to start making plans, serious plans. Anyways, uh, last week or the week before, we talked about one of the lessons that people learn when they undertake this journey. Lessons that you can only learn once you go on the journey. <coughs> so it's a must to take the journey. And uh, we talked about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually teaching us what tawakkul really means. Putting our trust in Him. And knowing that we don't control things, that it is Allah the Exalted who is in control of His universe. The other lesson that we learn while on this journey is that of humility. It makes or it ought to make a person humble again. And it does this in a number of ways. First of all, once you arrive in Jeddah, that's it. You are no longer a known person. You're unknown. Nobody knows you. No one knows how powerful you are, how wealthy you are, what kind of status you have back home. And so you become one of, of, of hundreds of thousands. And sometimes one... In, in, in millions you become unknown so you, your status doesn't mean anything anymore to the average person who is from another part of the world during Hajj no matter how wealthy you are or how powerful you are or who you are it doesn't matter to them they probably don't know you and so the status does not mean anything so to begin with on this journey, people lose that recognition. They lose that recognition whereby those around them know them. They know their status, they know their wealth, they know their authority and power that they have. You lose all of that. Completely unknown. And these things don't matter anymore. Then, when you perform, uh, Umrah and Hajj itself in Ihram, especially for the brothers. Masha Allah, you have to take off all your regular clothing, including all on the garments. And all you're wearing are two pieces of white cloth. That's it, nothing else. Two pieces of white cloth. Now, this Ihram garment, there are various qualities, right? You can buy a cheap quality, maybe 20 reals. You can buy a more expensive quality, maybe 70 reals. But at the end of the day, when you look at everybody in the two pieces of white cloth, in particular the men, of course, sisters uh, wear their regular clothing, you cannot distinguish the wealthy person from the poor person. The only time you can distinguish people of status is these, uh, you know, the VIPs who come and they have special police escorts where they block the crowd and they allow them to come in. I remember in 2000, at the Haram in Mecca, there were some VIPs who were there. And one morning after Fajr, after sunrise, in spite of the large number of people making tawaf around the Kaaba, the police were able to clear that entire area of Hujjaj. And then they allowed the VIPs to come in, MashaAllah, and just circle the Kaaba, kissing it, Kissing the black soul with every circle. So unless you're a VIP, 
you're not going to get any special treatment. You're one of everybody else. Two pieces of white cloth, so your, your level is lowered. Your level is lowered. And then you go to Mina, and it's a place where you have a tent, but the bed you sleep on is on the ground, nothing special. Although I have seen, I have seen some of these uh, luxury packages that they call, where they have beds, just like the beds we have back home here. It's not, the mattress is not flat on the ground. Right? It's, it's, it's on a, a bed. The frame, they, ha they have a frame for it, and it has a, a, a box board and then a mattress on top of that. I've seen that in Mina. I mean, uh, even this year I've seen that in, in certain packages. <laughs> but besides, this is the exception. Really, the rule is your mattress that you might get is flat on the ground, and you don't have much elbow room. You don't have much elbow room. So you're there with everybody else. Again, your status doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how wealthy you're, you're back home here. When you go there, you don't have the space that we tend to usually like over here. Right? Everybody wants big this and big that. Big kitchen, big bedrooms, big closets, mashallah. All right, you walk in some closets and you get lost. In Mina, mashallah, that's it. Just the space that your mattress takes up, that's all you have. Even your bag, you don't have much space for that. And if you're a bit for Hajj, you know what I'm talking about. And that's why we tell the brothers and sisters, when you go for Hajj, especially when you go for the five days in Hajj, take as least amount of things as possible. Because you're going to have to find space for, the, for your bag in the tent. But mashallah, I noticed this year they have put up a reasonably good shelves, so people have made use of the shelves. Or what we have done in the past is we use ropes and we just uh, tie the bags in the air. Then you go to, uh, to Muzdalifa. One of the best things that I personally have found about Hajj brothers and sisters is that night in Muzdalifa. I have found that one night is one of the best things to lower the level of a person, to make you humble. Where you come in Muzdalifa, a place that is open. We call it the All Stars Hotel because when you look up, if it's clear, you see all the stars. You have no tents. And it doesn't matter who you are, where you arrive, that's, that's the space you get. You come down on the ground and again, all you might have in terms of luxury is a sleeping bag from, from Canadian Tire. Some people have this, what they call the haji mat, which is a straw mat that you just spread on the ground. People just take a piece of cardboard with them. It's just one night, a few hours. But that one night really makes a person come to grips with the reality of who we are, how, how insignificant we really are. I remember one year when we arrived in Muzdalifa, there were a couple of sisters who said to me as we arrived and we settled down, you know what, we can't stay here this night. Because they couldn't stomach sitting there on the ground, just, just you know, you spread a hajimat and you're sitting on that. And people are walking by. So it's not like you have a separate private area where you're all by yourself. People are just walking up and down. And they said to me, you know, we can't stay, we need to leave. But eventually they settled down. And subhanAllah, later on in the night when I checked on the sisters, they were fast asleep. And they slept right up until we woke them for Fajr the next day. And I asked them, I asked them, because initially when you arrive, you feel, I can't sleep on the ground like this. People walking by. But eventually you settle down and you realize this is what you have to do. So I asked them, and they told me that they, this is one of the best sleeps they've gotten in a long time while over there. It makes you humble. And humility, brothers and sisters, is an integral character trait of the Muslim. In fact, everything about Islam seeks to make the individual humble. Everything seeks to remove pride and arrogance from the individual. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ, throughout his life, in particular as a messenger of Allah, because with this office, of course, his status and his importance was raised to high levels. 
He was no ordinary person per se, being the messenger of Allah. Yet, this important office that he held did not make him proud. And at no time did he display any kind of pride or arrogance with people. He, he remained a very simple and humble man up until the time he died, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In Medina, when Allah established Islam for him, and he was able to establish a strong and vibrant Muslim community, even then, he did not do anything to stand out from the people. He had no special clothing to wear. No special clothing to wear. No special office that he would sit in and meet people. He did that right in his masjid. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right in his masjid. After salah, he would turn around and after the tasbih and so on, so on, he was there to meet with the companions and to talk with them and answer their questions. In his masjid. No special office. Once Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu visited him in his home. And he was sleeping on a straw mat, a mat made from straw. And Umar radiallahu anhu saw some of the marks on his skin. You know that, you sleep on a straw mat, uh, and you wake up, you will find some marks on your body. And tears came out of the eyes of Umar ibn al-Khattab. He said, O Messenger of Allah, Caesar is sleeping on the best mattresses, and you are the Messenger of Allah. Look at what you're sleeping on. And the Prophet ﷺ smiled and said to him, O oh, Umar, aren't you happy that these luxuries are for them, meaning the disbelievers in this world, but they are for us, the believers in the next world? This is the humility of the Prophet ﷺ, that he remained a very humble individual throughout his life. And he taught this to his companions. So when Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was selected as the Khalifa, he did not display any pride or arrogance. He was not happy that he won victory over his opponent, as, as is the norm these days when people win elections. In fact, in his opening speech, we might call it his victory speech or acceptance speech, he said, Ya ayyuhan nas, Inni qad alaykum wa lastu If you look at his humility in his statement, you see the inner depths of his humility. He said, O people, this is how he began his speech. O people, indeed I was given authority over you. Wulli tu alaykum. I was given authority over you. I was made a wali over you. And this the use of this form of the verb implies that it is something that he never wants. He never wanted, he didn't go after it, but it was given to him. So I was made, I was given authority over you, bulitu alaykum, walastu bi khayrikum. Yet I am not the best among you. Subhanallah. He is the best, radiallahu anhu. And, and the companions have acknowledged this. The companions of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam have acknowledged that Abu Bakr as Siddiq after the Prophet ﷺ was the best person. This they acknowledge and admit it in their own life, lifetimes. Yet, he said, I'm not the best among you. When Umar ibn al-Khattab was the Khalifa, and this is a very famous incident, a man came from another city looking for the Khalifa. He didn't know Umar. And he asked people, in Medina, where is your Khalifa? I have some important news for him. And they told him, go under such and such a tree over there, you will see a man sleeping under the tree, that's the Khalifa. SubhanAllah. So it is humility, brothers and sisters, that is really key. In fact, it is pride and arrogance that resulted in, in, in Iblis being kicked out of paradise. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, no one with even an atom weight of pride in his or her heart will ever enter paradise. It is not pride and arrogance that takes a person into paradise or causes them to be admitted to paradise. It is humility and nothing else. So one of the great lessons that a person ought to learn on this journey of Hajj is humility.
And that's why it's important, that's why it's necessary for us as Muslims, especially for those who have not been there for Hajj, to make this plan seriously, to seriously plan for Hajj, make plans, and pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help you to realize your plan so that you can perform this journey. Because it's not just about fulfilling the, 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 the final pillar of Islam. That of course is, is important. But on this journey itself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will teach us many things. And we can only really experience these things on this journey, no other journey. So it's important for us to undertake it. That's why Allah says in, in Surah Al-Hajj, لِيَشْهَدُوا مَنَافِعَ لَهُمْ So that they may witness things that will be of benefit to them. Besides the performance of the duty of Hajj, the Farida of Hajj as a pillar of Islam, there are many other things we will witness, or people will witness as they go on this journey for Hajj, and these things would be of benefit to them as well. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us. May He bless our brothers and sisters who have not performed Hajj yet, uh, with the means, uh, the wealth and the health, uh, necessary to enable them to go for Hajj. May He uh, make it easy for them to make plans to go for Hajj sooner rather than later. May He open up our hearts and minds so that we can understand this great message He has revealed from mankind. And may He inspire all of us and motivate us to live by this message. May He cause us to always be humble people. In spite of our achievements, may He cause us to remain humble and simple. And may He keep us firm on the straight path and protect us from ever being proud or arrogant. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته.